Welcome to St. John's Lutheran Church, Springfield, Ohio. This is the fifth Sunday in Lent. We're located at 27 North Wittenberg Avenue, Springfield, Ohio. We're glad to have you here with us today. Please enjoy the service. Church, Springfield, Ohio, a in pastor, pastor Pollock, and this hymn, Beneath the Cross of Jesus, was written by Elizabeth Clafane. She wrote in 1868. It was written then, but it was not discovered until after she died. And Ira Shanky, and, um, who was a great evangelist, and Dwight L. Moody, who led meetings in England, discovered this hymn, and when they sang the hymn, Irish Hankey wrote the, the uh, music, it was later uh, different t tunes, he wrote the original music Beneath the Cross of Jesus, and the writer of this was just a simple lady, a daughter of a sheriff in Edinburgh, Scotland. She was a wonderful uh, poet, and Irish Hankey cried the first time he sang it. Very appropriate for Lent. Elizabeth Clefane. Go. 
Island, Scottish Ham. giving the first reading.
But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another, or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, said the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sins no more. The word of the Lord. Thank you, God. Becky Dimitrioff will be doing the 51st song. We'll do the second reading. A reading from Hebrews. Christ did not glorify himself in becoming a high priest, but was appointed by the one who said to him, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. As he also said in another place, You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, offered up prayers and supplication with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was the son, he learned obedience in what he suffered, and having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. Having been designated by God a high priest, according to the order of Melchizedek, the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The pastor's pastor, John Pollock, will be reading the gospel for today. This is the gospel acclamation. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. 
Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me serves the Father with me. The Father will honor me. Now my soul is troubled, and what should I say? Father, save me from this hour. No, it is for this reason that I come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said that it was thunder. Others said an angel had spoken to him. Jesus answered, This voice has come for your sake, not for mine. Now it is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. So, Gospel of our Lord. Praise you, O Christ. You may be seated. A couple of announcements. Quickly, first of all, it's hard to believe, but this Wednesday is our last midweek Wednesday Lenten service for this Lenten season. Uh, 2 o'clock and 7 o'clock, we will be examining the fifth word from the cross, I thirst. This will be the last soup and sandwich supper at 6. Because if you've looked at the calendar, you know that next Sunday we celebrate Palm Sunday and the beginning of Holy Week. And of course, during Holy Week, due to services on Thursday and Friday at 2 and 7, there is no Wednesday night service. So our Lenten pilgrimage is almost at an end. Please join us this Wednesday either at 2 or 7 for worship and at 6 for the soup and salmon supper. Also, a special welcome to all those family and friends of Otto who are here to celebrate his 90th birthday. So, Brother Otto, happy 90th birthday. music by the choir under the direction of Vicki Perks. Our anthem this morning is taken from the song for this morning, Create in Me a Clean Heart.
grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Do you know what is your purpose in life? Do you know why you were born? That is a question that has been asked throughout the ages. The philosophers, the sociologists, and the gurus, and the self-proclaimed know-it-alls have tried to answer that question throughout the ages. An entire industry has been created and the self-help books and the books telling you how to have a purpose in life or what your purpose in life is. And a lot of people spend a lot of money buying these books or reading articles and magazines about what your purpose in life is. And they will fix their mind on following what these articles or books say and they'll follow them for a while and then after so many months or after a year or so, they find that their life is no different than what it was before they began. And they find themselves still trying to answer that question, what is the purpose of my life? What am I doing here? How do I find fulfillment? And of course, the devil, using society, will tell you that the purpose of your life is to fulfill the desires of the flesh. That the purpose of your life is to gather as much as you can gather to spend as much as you can spend, to grab as much as you can grab, and to trample over whatever you have to trample over in order to make it to the top. But we know from experiences of people who have lived lives like that, that their lives were empty. And when they came upon their hour of death, they had nothing to comfort them. They had nothing to hold on to. And they feared that that ending of their life. So what is the purpose of life? Why are you here? To answer that, we go back to our gospel lesson today. To that 12th chapter of the gospel according to St. John. And we're going to focus on that 27th verse where Jesus says, Now my soul is troubled, and what should I say? Father, save me from this hour. No, it is for this reason that I have come to this hour. And then in verse 28 he says, Father, glorify your name. Now my soul is troubled, and what should I say? These may sound like strange words when talking about the purpose of life, but when we put everything into context, we can see what that purpose will be. As Jesus is speaking, we have already had the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. The beginning of chapter 12, we read John's account of that of Jesus having the Palm Sunday experience, which we will celebrate next week. The crowds enthusiastically proclaiming him Messiah, Hosanna, I, in the name of the Lord, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna to the King. The crowd was full of excitement, the disciples were full of excitement. They thought now Jesus was going to fulfill what their wishes were, that he would be this earthly king who would drive out the Romans and set Israel up as the kingdom in the Mediterranean world. And of course, they as disciples would all be given choice <coughs> seats in the court of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus is preparing to celebrate the festival and some Greeks come up to him. People known as God fears. These were pagans who had not yet quite converted to Judaism, but they were very interested in Judaism, very interested in the idea of only one God, 
They were very interested in the ethical and moral teachings of Judaism. They were totally disgusted with their pagan worship and all the debauchery and all the immorality that went on along with worshiping the pagan gods and goddesses of Mount Olympus. And they want to see Jesus. So Philip tells Andrew, and Andrew comes to Jesus. Jesus gives that response about how the iris has come for him to be glorified. Also, if you study the Gospel of John closely, you know that in John's passion narrative, unlike Matthew, Mark, and Luke, he simply mentions Jesus and the disciples going to the Kidron Valley and to the Garden of Gethsemane, but describes nothing about Jesus praying, nothing about Jesus asking the disciples to stay awake with him and watch. And so some scholars think these, these words of Jesus in verse 27 are his Gethsemane words. And that John has just put them in this section in order to make his theological point. But Jesus says, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. And then in verse 27, he talks about how his soul is troubled. Because Jesus knows what's coming. That word trouble means to stir up, to agitate, to be stressed or to be pressured. Jesus, being truly human, could not deny the fear he had of crucifixion. Everyone knew the horrors of crucifixion. They saw it carried out far too often. They knew how those condemned to crucifixion were horribly beaten before forced to carry their cross to Gog of the Hill, there to be nailed to the cross to die. So he says, he, he stirred up, he's agitated. Then he says, and what should I say? Father, save me from this hour. That word save means deliverance from danger. Protect. The human side of Jesus. Admit that his purpose in life is going to be difficult now. That the reason he came up on earth is being ready to be fulfilled and he feels all that pressure, that stress. And the, a normal person would say, Father, deliver me from this. I, Father, protect me from this. Do not let this happen. But then he says, no, it is for this reason that I come to this earth. For this purpose that I've come. So what was the purpose of Jesus coming? To be the Savior of the world. The purpose of Jesus coming into this world was not to leave us four Gospels full of teachings. It was not for simply to place him on the shelf along with all the other prophets who would come to Israel. It was not for us to take the moral teachings of Jesus and put them in a book and expound on them in philosophy classes at the university. The purpose of Jesus coming to the world is to die on that cross, to pay the debt of sin that we owe. The purpose of Jesus being born as a beautiful little baby in Bethlehem that first Christmas, growing up into an adult, spending three years in itinerant ministry, all for the purpose of what is now about him. his passion, his death, his resurrection and ascension. Jesus knew this is why he had come to the world. And even though the human part of him recoiled at the thought of the pain that he was going to go through, he would in no way not carry out his father's will. And that gives us the first clue to what is the purpose of our lives. The purpose of every human being's life, whether they realize it or not, is to serve and obey God. Willfully. Not by force. But willfully. We go back to the book of Genesis. And we read the creation story. We read how God put Adam and Eve in the garden. And everything was perfect. And we read how God did not make Adam and Eve be robots. 
So they definitely would follow his will and do what he wanted. But instead he gave them free choice. And for a while everything was perfect. Everything was wonderful. And then that day came. That Satan and the guides of the snake tempted them. So did God really say? See, that's putting doubt in your mind. Oh, is that what God really said? Maybe we misunderstood. Maybe God didn't really mean that we couldn't eat of this fruit. So, having free choice, they gave in to the temptation. They ate of the forbidden fruit. Sin entered the world. And ever since God has looked for a people who would worship him and love him and serve him, not by force, but by faith, they would come to him in faith in response to the love he shows them through the sending of his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus shows us how being obedient to God the Father is our purpose. And that by being obedient to God the Father, we may go through difficulty in this life. We may have all kinds of troubles in this life. But just like Jesus went through the horror of the death of crucifixion, he then went to the third day to the glory of his resurrection, 40 days later to his ascension, where he waits to come again in glory. And so on this earth, by being obedient to God, we may suffer. By being obedient to God and serving God, we may have persecution. We may have friends quit being our friends when they find out that we love Jesus more than we love life. But the glory to come will be so much greater than any glory we can have on earth. No matter how much you collect, no matter how many awards you pick up, no matter how many championships you may win, no matter how big your bank account might be, all of that means nothing when compared to eternity. So the purpose of life is for us to come to a relationship with God and faith in Jesus Christ and to serve our Lord Jesus Christ willingly and obediently. Now that doesn't mean that he won't be tempted to do otherwise. That won't mean that there will not be those times in your life where you will be tempted strongly to turn your back on what Jesus is calling you to do. It's then that you rely on the power of the Holy Spirit. You pray to the Lord Jesus and fill you with that Holy Spirit so that you may resist that temptation to be disobedient. To not follow the will to which Jesus is directed. We all know the story of Jonah. How God called Jonah to deliver a message to the city of Nineveh, Israel's enemy. And how Jonah figured he could outsmart God by going the opposite direction, not going to Nineveh, not giving him the message, and therefore God would destroy him. Which would make Jonah just really <coughs> make Jonah as happy as three fourths of this of basketball, college basketball fans would be happy if somebody would knock off that team that's 36 and 0, <laughs> send them home without a national championship. So Jonah thinks he's outsmarting God. We know what happens. Everybody's familiar with the storm comes, the sailors panic. Jonah says, I'm the fall, I'm the problem. Throw him overboard, the great fish swallows him, repents, spit up on shore three days later, goes to Nineveh, preaches of a great revival, breaks out. Oh, Nineveh repents. So that's our purpose in life. To serve willingly to where God comes. No matter what vocation, no matter what field, no matter what you do in life, God is calling you in faith in Jesus Christ to be his servant, to be his witness. 
to share the good news of the gospel with others. Some of you have heard me tell my story before, but others of you I don't think have. Ever since I was in the third grade, I felt the call to be a pastor. My mama tells me she never remembers me saying that, never going to be anything else. Of course, along the way, before I became a pastor, I had dreamed of being a high school basketball and football star, <laughs> which I may have gotten the award for being the best bench sitter on the football and basketball team. <clears throat> the most enthusiastic non-starter. You know, I had dreams of being a college player on one sport or the other. But I always had this feeling that I was called to be a pastor. Well, my sophomore year in college, I went to Transylvania University. For those of you not familiar with Transylvania, it's a small Christian college in Lexington on the opposite side of the evil empire that's on the other side of Lexington. <laughs> and Transylvania, as I say, was a church related college, and they had what they called a pre seminary track. And that's what I was majoring in, and minoring in history. Well, my roommate, fraternity brother, roommate, I saw him here. He was from Queens, New York. And his dad suddenly died of a heart attack. He had to go back to New York for the funeral and so forth. For some reason, that really shook me up. I couldn't imagine my dad dying by not being here. So after my sophomore year in college, I transferred to the University of Louisville for my junior year where my dad was a professor. And I began to major strictly in education with the idea of being certified to be a history teacher which my dad kind of encouraged because he had had a lot of former pastors come through to be teachers after they had either burned out the ministry or been disillusioned or whatever. And he said it would be something good to fall back on that. Something went wrong. So during that junior year, I began to want to do what I wanted to do. So I stopped listening to that call to be a pastor and started gearing more toward wanting to be a teacher and a coach. And as often told those who were close to me, that junior year in college was my three days in the belly of the big fish. That that year was my journey year. And by the end of my junior year, I decided to transfer back to Transylvania. And in the meantime, when you transfer from a private school to a public school and back to a private school, you lose credits and so forth. So I got a little envelope in the mail one day, my new draft card. And my new draft card said that no longer was a one Z or H or whatever it was for being a college student. I was an L1A. And about six weeks after that, I got another letter from Uncle Sam. And this one said, to report to the federal building in downtown Bull at 5 o'clock in the morning on such and such a date to take a physical to see if I was fit to be put in the draft. And with a draft number of 20, I knew if I was physically healthy, that was going to happen. But I went, so I went down and reported for the physical and went through the physical. And I was talking to one fella. He was on his third time going through the draft physical. On his sheet it said, not fit for the US Navy, not fit for the Marines, not fit for the Army. I'm like, good gosh, it's fought three different ones. What are they hoping you can qualify for? The only thing he would figure out was maybe the Coast Guard stationed on the Ohio River or something. <laughs> but anyhow, I went through the physical. Never heard another thing. 
I did write a letter to my draft board explaining my situation with my credits and so forth. Got back on my seminary track in Transylvania. And in that spring, Melvin Laird, the Secretary of Defense, announced that the draft was over. And no one else would be drafted. Now I know that affected everybody. A lot of people besides just me. But I've never been convinced that that was done because God was looking back, was looking after me since I had gone back to follow him, his will instead of following my will. <coughs> so I entered graduating college, entered seminary, Hammond, old Hammond School of Theology. My second year in seminary, Dr. Sal Hammer, some of you knew, president and Old Testament professor, and Dr. Johnson, the dean of the school and New Testament professor, appointed me to be their representatives when seniors who had their senior project in order to graduate, or hope to graduate, and receive their master's degree in divinity. And again, I saw that as a gift from God for having gone back to follow him with him. Here I was a sophomore, although in seminary you don't really call it freshman sophomore, but it's easier to use those terms. Here I was a second year student, grading and determining whether those ready to graduate would graduate or not on behalf of the biblical division. See, this is our purpose in life, to follow the will of God. And although it may seem difficult at times, Although it may not seem as glorious, and I have to admit, when it's football bowl season, when it's now final four season, there's that little urge in me wishing I'd coach. And I coached in junior high, school in high, in high school as an assistant coach. I was pretty good. But what gives me real satisfaction is when I'm in this bowl. When I feel that Holy Spirit take hold, and I'm allowed to preach Jesus' precious word to you. This is our purpose in life. Whether it's a preacher, a teacher, a dog catcher, a garbage collector, a carpenter, an electrician, a plumber, a landscaper, a grass cutter, a painter, a nurse, a doctor, a lawyer, no matter what we're in, our vocation, we are called. To serve God obediently as our Lord Jesus Christ. His soul was troubled. This is the same word Jesus used in John 14 when he says, Let not your hearts be troubled. His heart and his soul is stirred up, it's agitated, it's pressured, it's stressed. But he will not say, Father, save me from this heart. This is why I have come, this is my purpose, to die so that we might live. So we, as followers of Jesus, follow his example. And we serve God with him and obediently to him. It may be rough at times. It may be difficult. We may, may, may never gain any of the world's riches. But we will gain everlasting life. We will gain that wonderful mansion the kingdom of God. We'll walk the streets of that new Jerusalem. Peter, Andrew, James, and John. And we'll have all eternity with those family members and friends who've gone before us at the time. So that is your real purpose in life. To willingly serve God. And to be obedient to His will. You won't always do it perfectly. Because we sin and fall short of the glory of God. But with the help of the Holy Spirit, we can do it far more successfully than we believe. So let us follow our example, this example of Jesus, and fulfill that true purpose in life. Serving and being obedient to our Lord Jesus Christ. And sharing with others that good news of the gospel. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding. Give your hearts and minds to Christ Jesus.
Second, the fifth Sunday of Lent. During Lent, we Lutherans believe in meditation. We pray for forgiveness of our sins. We uh, focus on almsgiving for the poor. And we meditate on Jesus Christ suffering for us and increase our relationship with Jesus Christ. As we repent, believe, love God, Jesus, Father, Son, Holy Ghost, and love one another love our neighbors as ourselves. All these things are part of Lent. All these things are part of Lent all the time for a Christian, but especially during Lent, we focus on prayer, fasting, and our relationship with Jesus. Next Sunday is Palm Sunday. This is St. John's Lutheran Church. We invite you to come worship with us. Uh, our 
Wednesday service. The last one is this week. Soup and sandwich at 6 o'clock and Lenten service is at 7 o'clock. This is our last meditation on the words of Christ from the cross as he is dying. It's been wonderful meditation as Pastor has given to us and we've all studying this and learning more and more and feeling closer and closer to Christ as we have these meditations. We invite you to join us Palm Sunday, 8 o'clock and 10.30. Also Holy Week, Good Friday, Monday, Thursday, and of course Easter Sunday. That's Holy Week. We invite you to join us, St. John's Lutheran Church, Springfield, Ohio, Corner of Wittenberg, Columbia, and it's right across the street from the new hospital, Springfield Regional Hospital. Our videographer is Linda Fox, and I'm Sally, your announcer. We've had others that have helped us with the videos. We appreciate that.
St. John's on YouTube. Tune in anytime for our broadcast. We're happy to bring you our service. And remember, we have many services that are coming up. We have next week is Palm Sunday, followed by Holy Week, which is Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, and Easter. We're welcome to come to any of these services. We offer a Christian school, ages 3 and 4, nursery and pre-K. You can call the school office for that, 325-4311. Tune in anytime to YouTube. Thank you for joining us. We hope and pray that God will continue to bless you and keep you this day and all your days. We'll pray for you, continue to pray for us, and our YouTube